Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, tonight is special for a number of reasons, I think, not just because of the weather that London has finally managed to turn on. Um, it's my personally my first event as the director of the Menzies Australia Institute. It's also, from what I understand, the first in-person event that the Menzies has had for the best part of two years. So yay. <laughs> It's really wonderful to have um, the Menzies Australia Institute community here. This, you know, you're such a large part of our existence of what we do and having your faces here and in person is a really wonderful sort of um, shot in the arm for us all. This is also the first event in what is our 40th anniversary year. In 1982, what was then the Australian Studies Centre was established within the University of London with Geoffrey Bolton as director and a comfortable and spacious townhouse at Russell Square. <laughs> Over the years, uh, the institutes changed names, addresses and affiliations several times. But what hasn't changed is the marked contribution that the staff and directors of the Menzies Australia Institute had made to the study of Australia in the UK and to the fields of Australian history, literature and culture more broadly. It's been staffed by luminaries of Australian scholarship in names including like Tom Miller, Frank Borgiano and of course, Carl Bridge. Carl's contribution to the Menzies Australia Institute has been profound and long lasting. Appointed to the role in 1997, he was central to the negotiations that saw it brought into King's College London. So he's very much responsible for us being here. And he oversaw the Australian government's $5 million endowment, which is what got us established, still keeps us running in many ways today. After a long and eminent career spanning 25 years at King's now, it's fitting then that Professor Carl Bridge gives the Menzies lecture tonight. To tell us a little bit more about Carl's distinguished career, I'm delighted to welcome two of his longtime colleagues, Professor Stephen Lovell and Dr. Simon Slight. I'll introduce them first and then I'll get out of your hair. Professor Stephen Lovell is Professor of Modern History and Head of the Department of History here at King's College London. His re research has spent, spanned histories of reading, print culture, radio and public speaking in 19th and 20th century Russia. And he's an author of numerous books, including several prize winning ones in that field. Dr. Simon Slight is reader of urban history, historical youth cultures and Australian history also here at King's College London. He is the deputy director of the Menzies Australia Institute. And like Stephen, his work is wide ranging and takes in concepts of space, place and identity, as well as generational, generational and social divides in Australia, the UK and beyond. Both Simon and Stephen have been colleagues of Carl's in the Department of History for many years. And so it's my great pleasure to hand over to them to tell us more about Carl's life and work before Carl Bridge himself takes the podium to deliver tonight's lecture. Well, thank you very much, Agnieszka, and uh, and it's also wonderful, of course, to to have have you here and for this to be your, in a sense, inaugural uh, event. But um, but it's mainly Carl I want to uh, to talk about, and um, it's actually this evening's the first time I've seen Carl in person, probably since I became head of department, which was February uh, 2020, uh, on the eve of a certain uh, uh, global pandemic. Um, and the fact I haven't seen him before is no reflection on Carl whatsoever, it's a reflection of the circumstances that we all know that we've uh, endured and we seem to be just about the other side of now. Um, but one of the things that struck me uh, quite early on when we were desperately um, shifting all our operations to online, putting our teaching online, was a, 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 a conversation I had with Carl over the phone or on Teams, where he, he told me that um, he had considerable uh, prior experience of online education at the University of New England. Um, so uh, the things you learn about your colleagues, and this was actually kind of deeply reassuring to me at that particular moment, that at least someone knew what they were doing uh, and might have some uh, 
might have some insights. And it also uh, absolutely uh, gives light to lazy stereotypes of senior professors uh, who, who can't tell a, a mouse from a, a doorknob. Um, uh, and so, so the very opposite, and Carl really uh, embraced uh, online teaching, you know, partly because of, of, of choice, uh, but he did um, uh, as much of it as anyone in the department. I mean, he's always uh, uh, absolutely sort of carried his share uh, and and done done uh, really important things uh, in our in our curriculum. So I really uh, appreciate you know the and and what I what I feel about uh, as I kind of enter um, uh, secure middle age is that what goes around comes around and the things that seem. Uh, might seem sort of traditional in a somewhat stodgy way, actually are eternally interesting and uh, eternally attract uh, uh, the younger generation and students. So, for example, Carl's longstanding module on uh, war in the Pacific uh, has been uh, um, uh, a, a kind of major uh, contributor to, to kind of uh, student satisfaction, but also it's just drawn a lot of students in. It's been it's been one of the highest recruiters, and um, and funnily enough, it's become all the more important in the last uh, four or five years since we've had a history and international relations program, and of course with everything going on in the world, uh, these issues of diplomacy, security, the Pacific region just seem all you know all the more important. So so Carl Carl is 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 absolutely uh, uh, you know remaining at the at the cutting edge of what 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 is considered. Uh, important in the world. And I also want to emphasize how important Australia is to us in, in the history department. Um, it's been a wonderful uh, juxtaposition of, of menses in history over the last generation or so, or more even. Um, and uh, it, it was in the old federal degree when there was a division of labor between the different history departments. Australia was belonged to kings. Um, We've now expanded and there are other parts of the world that we lay claim to um, that we didn't before. Um, but Australia remains ours, you know, we kind of, uh, uh, and, uh, and say, you know, as, as the way we study history and the way that we think uh, about the world becomes all the more connected, uh, Australia um, uh, becomes all the more valuable. It was always valuable on its own terms. It's a, it's a kind of a big and important country, but uh, it, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's not going away. It's not going away and it remains uh, it remains very important to us. So Carl has been a hugely valued uh, colleague for us in the history department for, uh, for many years. But I'm conscious that as a, uh, a non-Australianist, um, uh, I, I speak with slightly less authority than the person who's going to uh, follow me on the podium, uh, Simon Slight, who will give you the, 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 the lowdown on, on Carl uh, uh, in, in, in the history department. But, but thank you on behalf of the history department and on behalf of all of the colleagues who expressed the kind of appreciation and can't be here to, uh, to, uh, tonight. I really want to thank you for everything that you've, you've done over so many years. Well, good evening, um, everyone. And thanks to Agnieszka for the lovely introduction. And uh, so nice to see you all here, so many familiar faces. Um, as Agnieszka said, I'm the deputy director of the Menzies, but I'm also one of Carl's master's students, former master's students, I've finished it now. Um, but uh, a few years ago, um, I, uh, I, I, I did go through the program. Um, so it's my great pleasure then to offer some words seeking just to outline some of Carl's scholarly contributions over the years. So I first met Carl when I applied to read for a master's in 2001, and that was partly through the Menzies, but based up the road at that other university somewhere in Bloomsbury that we don't mention too often. Um, on that day and subsequently, Carl was always really very generous with his time, something I know a lot of you will also uh, have experienced, and also with his books. Uh, lending me all manner of things, from the witty and insightful works of Keith Dunstan to hard-to-find periodicals from his own bookshelf. Now, this was principally for the purposes of my MA dissertation, which focused on Sydney and the activities there of social Puritans, or, as they were termed at the start of the 20th century, wowzers. <laughs> uh, we only want social evils righted, was apparently <laughs> one of the places it had come from. And it was in Sydney, here's the segue, it was in Sydney, that Carl was born and schooled before moving on to the University of Sydney, where he took a BA in history 
an excellent choice of degree. I'm sure we would all agree. At Flinders University in Adelaide, Carl studied for both a PhD in history and a diploma in education. And on the latter, and as, as Stephen has alluded to, I should like to highlight that Carl's teaching has always been very well regarded by his students, not only for his intellectual and book lending generosity, but for his considered appraisals of writing, his relaxed and engaging teaching style, and his concern for professional development and the next step. So after completing his doctorate, Carl taught at Flinders and at the University of New England in Armadale before his appointment to the directorship of the Menzies Centre, as it was then here in Britain in the late 1990s. And at the helm of the Menzies, as Agnieszka has already alluded to, Carl helped oversee its structural incorporation into King's College London and its re-endowment by the Australian government, two really crucial moves that served to secure our long-term future. Regular Menzies publication series, uh, research seminars and public events were also a feature of Carl's tenure as director, a tenure that ran for some 14 years before my colleague Dr Ian Henderson took up the baton. There were also Christmas sing-alongs featuring sea shanties, <laughs> games of cricket featuring star, with my predecessor Frank Bongiorno serving as wicketkeeper, <laughs> um, and away days. And it's also worth noting in this era of cramped office sharing that Carl enjoyed the most magnificent of offices. The best one probably being the one overlooking Russell Square, where, as still is true with his office here at King's, uh, a collection of artworks gifted or loaned to the Menzies adorned the walls. I mention this as one always got the feeling that upon entering Carl's office, it was a bit like finding a little bit of Australia in London. The space advertised the project, as it were, just as all inspiring locations should. Visiting fellowships were also part of the mix, and Carl enjoyed stints in Dublin and two in Cambridge to work on specific outputs. Now, in terms of those publications, Carl has many to his name. One of the first I read, in full at least, was an early one, a commissioned history titled A Trunk Full of Books, a history of the State Library of South Australia, published in 1986. Carl is also especially well known for his work with Kent Vodorovich in defining the British world as an object of study, as well as for his contributions to the history of diplomacy. So thinking here of his work uh, and his book indeed on the Washington Diaries of R.G. Casey, for instance, and the edited collection on the Australian High Commissioners here in Britain. Other book length works, co-edited or, or sole authored, include one that I haven't read, but I want to, Revolution, A History of the Idea, 1985, Holding India to the Empire, 1986, Munich to Vietnam, 1991, Dedicated Studies of Historians Manning Clark and Russell Ward, Pacific Prospects, 1992, and also a work unfolding later into Carl's very popular undergraduate module on the history of the, of the Pacific, as Stephen alluded to just before. And then Australians in Britain, 2009, Australia Goes to Washington, 2016, and a study of a sprightly little fellow named William Hughes, about whom quite a bit more soon. So tonight's event offers, I think, and I hope, a semicolon rather than a full stop in this publication sequence. The weighty interpreted collection of documents, Australia in War and Peace, 1914 to 19, co-edited with Dr. Jatinder Mann, and also featuring Dr. Bart Zielinski, who's also here uh, as a contributor, um, is for instance forthcoming, and this will mark the culmination of over a decade of studious scholarship. The work promises to play to Carl's strengths in examining the intersections between domestic politics, diplomacy, and military decision-making. All of which uh, I think serves as a curtain raiser to tonight's lecture. So with our warm and collective thanks to you, Carl, and um, with a little bit of assistance from Agnieszka just to get the right slides up, um, over to you once more. Thank, Thank you. Well, 
what can I say after all of that, except thank you very much indeed to my colleagues, and I hope I don't uh, totally disappoint. Sorry I lost that building up there in Austin <laughs> Square. <laughs> We did, we did replace it with the High Commission building, but uh, the tenure wasn't for very long. We were always a bit suspect. I said, we don't want students in our building. They're unreliable. They might see something, but do something. And I said, oh, yes, <laughs> they're the future. Anyway, that's another story. So thank you. Thank you all for that very uh, generous introduction. Uh, oops. So oh. where my, my notes did that. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Take them away. It's very sensitive. It's incredibly sensitive. Okay. Oh. Hmm. That's the TARDIS. It's a joy to be here after the trials of the last couple of years, as Stephen was alluding, addressing friends and colleagues in the flesh under the aegis of the Menzies Institute and Kings. I came to the Menzies as its lecturer in 1987, when it was known as the Australian Studies Centre London. There were one or two others around the world in those days. So I don't know where they are anymore, uh, but there was one, there was one in, in, uh, in Japan, I remember. Uh, but uh, soon became came with new funding, uh, the Sir Robert Menzies Centre for Australian Studies, which was a mouthful. Then, of course, later on the Menzies Centre and now the Menzies Australia Institute. Tonight's lecture falls into a Menzies Lecture capital M, capital L series that some of you in the room uh, will remember going back through the years. The first one was in 1988, given by Sir Selman Cowan, who was then uh, chair of the Menzies Board. Uh, but of course, it had been Governor General, and at the time was uh, was the uh, Provost of Oriel College in Oxford. Others followed in that series. Uh, one by Prime Minister John Howard, another by Mark Latham when he was leader of the opposition. One by the editor of the Times, an Australian editor of the Times, uh, John Thompson, uh, CEO of Rio Tinto couple of state premiers, number of scholars, uh, and separately, interestingly, two Manning Clark biographers. Um, one of whom happened to be head of the Menzies at the time, and the other one uh, wrote a better biography a bit later. Uh, oh, I shouldn't be saying that because we're being streamed, aren't we? They might be watching. <laughs> Happens, it's, a, it's an occupational hazard. Why Menzies? Um, because he'd been Australian Prime Minister most associated with Anglo-Australian uh, links. And because consequently he became, uh, with Sir Alec Douglas Hume, concerned at the fissaporous uh, possibilities of Britain's common market entry back in the 1960s, early 70s. Recognizing the crucial importance of the informal people-to-people -people connection they encouraged the formation of a number of complementary institutions, such as the Business Oriented Cook Society, the popular Britain Australia Society, and this institute. In our case, to foster continuing scholarly exchange and understanding of Australia in the United Kingdom and more widely across Europe. This mission, of course, remains as the Menzies Australia Institute celebrates its 40th birthday this year, and long may it continue. Now, Billy Hughes. Australia's great war prime minister, William Morris Hughes, uh, universally known as, it's going to work for me. No, there we go. All right, there we go. That's, uh, a sculpture of him done in the, it's now in the uh, old Parliament House in Canberra. Um, you can see that he had a hearing problem, uh, but he also had a lot of character. Billy Hughes, universally uh, Australia's most storied political leader, is encrusted, as it were, with more barnacles than the QE2. His diminutive size, 
five feet five if you believe his passport, five feet seven if you believe his who, who's who entry. Uh, he usually went by five foot seven, as you can see, and his simian physique, thin, big eared, long limbed. You see what I mean? That's a Will Dyson cartoon from 1912. Uh, we're a gift to cartoonists, most notably the great David Lowe, who made his name, of course, uh, between the wars and during the Second World War uh, in Britain, uh, but before that had been a cartoonist in Australia, uh, cutting his teeth, as it were, on Billy Hughes. David Lowe's Billy book, well, there's another Billy representation. <laughs> David Lowe's, David Lowe's Billy book uh, sold 60,000 copies in 1918, uh, a book of cartoons uh, about Hughes of going to London. He hadn't, hadn't actually uh, arrived at uh, Versailles or, or in London at this stage. And you can see that, you can see the, the sort of monkey-like characteristics there. Uh, also played on, on the uh, uh, channeling Charlie Chaplin, as it were. So Hughes, all the, all the pictures of Hughes, in the cartoons, his, his clothes are always too big and he's, he's always sort of walking in that sort of duck footed duck manner. Uh, why not? Charlie did very well, didn't he? Uh, Billy Hughes's lightning wit is justly celebrated. It wasn't just that he, did, he, did, he looked extraordinary. I uh, know, we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> um, here are a few examples to whet our appetites. He said of Robert Menzies, for whom this lecture is named, he said of Robert Menzies, who was then leader of the UAP, the United Australia Party, this United Un-Australian and not a party, as somebody once said, uh, the United Australia Party, which Hughes was a member, that Menzies couldn't, I'm quoting him, couldn't lead a flock of homing pigeons. Something's gone this when Prime Minister, when he compared Prime Minister Alfred Deacon to Judas in accusing him of political betrayal uh, before the First World War, he remarked that at least Judas had the decency to kill himself afterwards. And Hughes once described the intensity of a drought in Queensland by saying that even, quote, the frogs had forgotten how to swim. <laughs> Later, he quipped that his second wife, Dame Mary Hughes, had such a fetish for tidying up that the angel Gabriel would lose his horn and the resurrection would be delayed while they were looking for it. He'd mislaid a manuscript in his house. <laughs> but Hughes was much more than a comic character. It fell to him to be Australia's prime minister for most of the First World War, and that was a serious business. Hughes is celebrated for his 51 continuous years in federal parliament. 51 continuous years in federal parliament from the start to 1952. Eight years before that in New South Wales parliament, so 58 continuous years in parliament. But Hughes is most remembered for two significant events in his political career, standing up for Australia against the all powerful, sanctimonious and humorless United States President Woodrow Wilson at Versailles in 1919, and a little earlier, splitting his Labour Party and the Australian nation over conscription in 1916-1917. He's usually lionised as a great nationalist for the former and demonised as a Labour rat for the latter. Ten years ago, I published a biography of Hughes based mostly on his voluminous, though haphazard, private papers. Over the last 10 years, I've led happily a team of eight scholars delving into the official archives in the UK and Australia to investigate Anglo-Australian relations uh, between 1914 and 1919, uh, uh, the war and, and Versailles. For a forthcoming documentary volume to be published in the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade series. And I'm delighted to see several of the team here tonight, uh, Jatinda Mann, um, Simon Slate uh, involved early on, uh, you can blame Simon partly for how big that book's become. <laughs> um, and Bartzelinski. Tonight's lecture is based on some of what we've found. In other words, I wrote a book 10 years before I knew what I was writing it about. 
Uh, now I've done all the research, I'm doing another book that's going to tell me what I should have written 10 years ago. That's the way history works. In his own colorful memoirs, Crusts and Crusades, 1948, and Policies and Potentates, 1950, Hughes presents himself as the heroic, far-seeing statesman, uh, often acting in defiance of his myopic safety-first colleagues. In fact, we've found a shrewd political operator who calculated the odds and acted accordingly and was never quite out of step with his cabinet back home. That's what he looked like before he became the monkey. Um, Billy was a Cockney Welshman, born in Pimlico, just down the road in 1862, of an English speaking Welsh mother from the North Wales border near Landudno, and a Welsh speaking father from Holyhead, who was a carpenter employed by the Houses of Parliament in Westminster. His mother died when he was only six. He was sent for the next six years to live with his maternal aunt who kept a boarding house in Landudno, uh, where the young Will, as he then was called, uh, would have met her most famous holiday guest, the liberal radical orator, John Bright. And where the family read the Bible uh, communally uh, each evening, uh, a practice that he continued uh, for the rest of his life where he could. Age 12, Will came back to London where he spent six years as a pupil and then a pupil teacher uh, in the Devil's Acre, a rough Pimlico stews. And that's a bit hard to imagine these days, Pimlico as a, as a rough stews, but it was in those days. Um, he was at a school uh, known uh, locally as Mrs. Burdett Coots's school, a ragged school uh, for working class boys. Um, and uh, later it, it made the transition to uh, being called St. Stephen's School after the Anglican church that was nearby. Though he always said he went to St. Stephen's Grammar. He didn't. A slight and wiry lad, he taught classes of 60 or more, this is a pupil teacher, and commanded their attention with his knowledge and his ready wit. So he's learning how to speak to large groups and to keep them under control. And this is, of course, what he does later on as a trade union leader in Australia. None other than the celebrated poet educator, Matthew Arnold, who was the school inspector for the school, uh, was impressed uh, by his formal elocution. Matthew Arnold gave him the complete works of Shakespeare, apparently, which he prized. He also enlisted for a time as a militia man in the Royal uh, Fusiliers, so we have him there, young Billy. Once qualified as a teacher, however, wanderlust uh, at the sight of tall ships, or so he says, uh, in the Thames induced Will and a friend in 1884 to apply for assisted passages to Queensland, where they went to seek their fortunes. The Australia to which they traveled was very different from Australia today. It was a very British affair. Two thirds of its trade, virtually all of its overseas investment and nearly all of its immigrants came from the United Kingdom. All six Australian colonies, they hadn't federated yet, that didn't happen until 1901, uh, saw themselves as Neo-Britons. More advanced in their politics, more socially liberal, more prosperous per capita than the mother country but very much part of the British Empire, members of a British cultural, political, and economic world under the global protective wing of the all-powerful Royal Navy, or so they thought. Though the physical distances were much greater and much else, Hughes' move to Brisbane in many ways was just as an extension of his move to London from Landudna. If we cast forward to 1914-15, two strong gauges of Australia's then Britishness are that 400,000 400, immigrants had arrived from the UK in the previous five years. Now this is coming into a population of 4 million. Now think about that, 400,000 arrived. 
of the Australian soldiers who landed on the first day at Gallipoli were born in the United Kingdom, which isn't surprising when you consider that that 400,000 had injected themselves into Australia. They weren't the first wave. That's very much an Anglo-Australia uh, that we're talking about. They're not necessarily one that tugs the forelock at all. In Brisbane, there was considerable unemployment and the adventurous young man decided to follow a great Australian tradition and hump his bluey uh, on the wallaby track. And if you don't know what that means, I'm not gonna tell you. Uh, in other words, <laughs> to join the tramping through the vast outback uh, in search of itinerant labor. For two years, he lived close to the breadline, droving, fettling on the roads and railways, working as a cook, briefly soldiering again, uh, guarding a, a dump somewhere in the north of Queensland, apparently, um, and being a ship's steward in the coastal trade, uh, where he learned some of his early union uh, activity, learned about. On a cold bush night, he caught an ear infection, which rendered him hard of hearing for life. Through this school of hard knocks, he got to know Australia, and in the inimitable words of Donald Horn, quote, with buggers, bloodies, bastards, and blithering blazers, he became an Australian. We don't do that sort of thing. Others can say. Eventually, he gravitated to Sydney, first got a job in an iron foundry, then started a small repair shop in working class Balmain. He formed a common law relationship with Lizzie Cutts, his landlord's daughter. Um, and started a family in due course growing to six children. Balmain near the Sydney docks was a hotbed of political and union activity. And Billy, as he now was, made his shop a meeting place for discussion among the more intellectually inclined workers. It was among other things, a bookshop. In the aftermath of the great maritime and shearer strikes of the early nineties, Billy was enlisted as a recruiter by the Australian Workers' Union the Shearer's Union, the strongest union in Australia at the time, and stumped the unpack, signing up members on a interestingly Victorian payment by results basis. Now trade unions are doing that these days. I mean, it's a little bit, but anyway, that's what he did. So successful was he as a persuasive orator that in 1894, he was elected to the New South Wales Parliament uh, as a 32 as year old. Uh, to represent Sydney's inner west. As a parliamentarian, the young man who had arrived in Australia with two and sixpence would now be paid 300 pounds uh, per annum. So he'd made it into the middle class. I mean, he would never admit that at the time. In quick time, he became secretary of the New South Wales Wharf Labourers Union, another very strong union. Uh, then it's federal, of its federal equivalent, the Waterside Workers Federation, uh, qualified by night as a lawyer, uh, and in 1901 was elected to the first federal parliament. Over the next decade, he garnered a reputation as Australia's best industrial fixer, negotiating solutions to disputes on the wharves, among the seamen and in the coal mines. In other words, he did what Bob Hawke did much later, much better and much earlier. In parliament, he was a strong advocate of the racially based white Australia policy, without which to quote him, quote, colored Asiatics will pass over our border in a mighty Niagara, which will permanently undermine the constitutional vigor of which the Anglo-Saxon race is so proud. That from a Welshman. He wanted to break up industrial cartels if necessary by state in industrial competition. Uh, he wished for more federal powers and as Japanese influence expanded and Britain came to concentrate on the German threat, he was in favor of an independent Australian Navy and compulsory military training for all young men for home defense. The Labor government introduced compulsory military training in 1911 and over 600,000 were trained by 1914. It's astonishing. And the new battle cruiser Australia, there she is, uh, Accompanied by three new light cruisers and six destroyers, three submarines sailed into Sydney Harbour in 1913. So, so founding the Royal Australian Navy, just in time, you might have thought. Um, when the German uh, Pacific Squadron 
looked at the possibility of coming south to defend German New Guinea, as Bart knows very well. Um, they knew that Battlecruiser Australia was there and it outgunned them. So they went the other way. Thank you, Billy. When war broke out in 1914, there was a federal election progress. There nearly always is in Australia, but it's a three year electoral cycle. Um, and Andrew Fisher's Labour, uh, which Billy was the deputy leader, um, which had briefly been out of office again, uh, won the election with a memorable promise from the mouth of Fisher, but coined by wordsmith Billy Hughes to fight, quote, to the last man and the last shilling. Thank goodness we didn't. But that's hyperbole for you. That's what politicians do. We know that very well. They still do it. The Great War, as it developed, placed unpre unprecedented strain on Australia. The engines for growth had long been immigration and overseas trade. Wool, wheat, meat, minerals. Total war, Europe, ended immigration and strangled trade. The economy shrank by 10%. This was mitigated in part by volunteers going to the front, at least it gave them a job somewhere, although a bit risky, some 330,000 of them, but they had to be paid for. And what would happen if Britain and its allies lost the war? Billy Hughes was deputy leader and attorney general in the new government, and he saw the issues clearly. First, he had the War Precautions and Trading with the Enemies Acts passed, both even more draconian than their British equivalents. We can talk about that later if you like. Uh, these enabled the government. To drive German interests out of the key war industries, metals such as zinc, lead, copper, and to begin to organize commodity sales, wool, wheat, meat, tallow, leather, through government sponsored boards to maximize returns. By the autumn of 1915, with the army engaged in Gallipoli and pressure building up to consider conscription for overseas service, a world-weary Fisher, Andrew Fisher, the Prime Minister, decided to take up the post of High Commissioner in London and the fiery particle, as the Sydney Morning Herald called him, Hughes, uh, became Prime Minister. There he is, his first Prime Ministerial photograph, looking Prime Ministerial. Um, 52, it was. One of his first and continuing tasks then was to shore up the economy. This he did by negotiating the bulk purchase of the wool clip. Now, Britain agreed to buy the wool clip from Australia for the whole of the war. And that took some of the pressure off the main industry. A little bit of complaining towards the end of the war because the prices went up faster uh, than the original price paid, but still uh, they had the money in the bank. Similar deals were done for the strategic metals. Wheat proved more difficult. So there was a lot of it in the world, but even there he managed to sell over half of a bumper crop to the UK, even though the British government knew that most of it would remain undelivered. Most of this wheat that was being produced in Australia could not be got to market in Britain because the, uh, the ships uh, were uh, too busy dodging German submarines in the Atlantic and they weren't going to go on the Australian New Zealand run. So we're selling some products that are not going to get to market for political reasons, as it were, the British government have decided to buy these products in order to keep the Australian economy going. Long term view. Uh, but also, of course, to keep Australia in the war and to keep those recruits uh, going to the front. So thinking long term, the Board of Trade calculated that, to quote them, for high political reasons, they would continue to buy Australian goods. Similarly, the British Treasury, and this is work that Jatinda did, British Treasury tolerated so-called Australian war loans. That was, spelt, uh, that was spent on doing things like building the rail, transcontinental railway to Western Australia, which of course was about to be invaded, uh, and uh, digging dams and various other things. In other words, nation building infrastructure to give people jobs uh, and to keep Australia in the war. So in one sense, they were war loans, uh, but some people in the city of London didn't like the idea because the war loans ought to be spent on war things, 
uh, but Billy was quite good at, uh, at twisting arms about such things. So the Transcontinental Railway opens in 1917. British authorities also looked the other way when Hughes acted behind their backs in 1916 and bought 16 tramp steamers, so-called Billy's boats. Now all the shipping, the whole of the empire had been carefully brought together uh, to uh, operate across the Atlantic. Billy's under a lot of pressure to get some of his goods to market, even though the stuff had already been sold. Um, so he buys these tramp steamers uh, that weren't capable of getting any wheat anywhere. You know, they could just sort of creep along the New South Wales, Victorian you know, coast. But uh, they looked as though they were going to be a Commonwealth shipping line. So it was a political stunt. After the war, they were all sold very quickly because they were useless. Uh, but for a time, that looked as though we'd done the right thing. Now, have we ever seen other politicians do that sort of thing? <laughs> Airlines, Africa, I mean. <laughs> Voluntary enlistments in the Australian Imperial Force, the Australian Army going to the front, peaked in July 1915, so during the Gallipoli campaign, at 35,000 a month. But by the Somme summer of 1916, they had fallen below 10,000 a month where they would stay for the rest of the war. Given that the Battle of Pozier, then in progress uh, on the Somme, cost over 20,000 Australian casualties in five weeks, which was virtually as many or slightly less than uh, we suffered, Australia suffered in the whole time of uh, eight months at Gallipoli. Um, it seemed uh, that uh, something would have to be done. After a trip to London to sell Australia's commodities, this is in early 1916, uh, Hughes was minded to follow Britain and consider introducing military conscription for overseas service. So Britain had already introduced conscription by Act of Parliament. It's usual to read in Australian accounts that Hughes and his go-between, the journalist Keith Murdoch, uh, father of the blessed Rupert. Um, usual to read in Australian accounts that Hughes engineered a cable from the War Office in London with inflated demands for more recruits to bolster the case. In our researches, we found no smoking gun. There's one letter that says to Murdoch, you might be pleased with the figures. Now, does that mean there's a smoking gun? Well, generations of Australian historians have said yes, but we didn't find the War Office saying other than we need replacements for the numbers who died and were injured at Pozier, that's 20,000. And you're getting 10,000 a month by voluntary means. It's up to you to decide what to do about it. We have conscripted. That's, that's in the unspoken part of the messages. So no smoking gun. The War Office simply asked for replacements. In fact, there's nothing in the correspondence with the War Office for the whole war that mentions the word conscription. It's an Australian thing to decide whether to conscript or not. So it's up to the Australian government to decide how or whether to comply. With the trade unions and his Labour Party against conscription, to save his premiership, save his own prime minister's job, Hughes decided to go over the heads uh, of the trade unions and his own party uh, and to appeal directly to the people via a referendum uh, in October 1916. So Australia has the referendum method that uh, many other countries don't have. But he was overconfident. Under home defence legislation, his own home defence legislation, he called up all eligible men into camp in anticipation of victory in the referendum gave them all a dose of what it might be like if they were in the yard. He chose to scapegoat 12 anti-war industrial workers of the world in a show trial. And he tried to land 214 Maltese laborers in the country at a time when many men were unemployed, only to be labeled William Maltese Hughes. These red rags 
taunted the labor movement. The flavor of Hughes's rhetoric can be found in this extract from a speech in Melbourne in September, 1916. Every Australian, he said, is bound, and he used to do this sort of thing. Every Australian is bound by the sacred ties of honor, duty and kinship, that sort of thing. Um, every instinct of loyalty and self-preservation to do his fair share in the mighty effort of the empire and the allies to defeat Germany. Are we to crouch behind the valor of the other allied nations? Where is the man worthy of the name who will urge so craven a policy? Only he who has lost the ancient valor of his sires. Hmm. Later on, he would speak of how Germany wanted to, quote, encircle with her hairy arms the entire world. And how Australia was, in a mixed metaphor, awaiting the swoop of the vulture. The propaganda on each side of the debate was virulent. That's a famous anti-conscription post and needs no explanation. On the anti-side, we have where are we? the blood vote. Why is your face so white, mother? Why do you choke for breath? Oh, I have dreamt in the night, my son, that I doomed a man to death. They put a dagger into my grasp, it seemed but a pencil then. I didn't know it was a fiend to gasp for the priceless blood of men. It's a wonderful person. This was reproduced uh, in the uh, anti-Vietnam War uh, years in the 1960s and 70s, which was so. Uh, so graphic. I, I, I like the fiend, the devil in the background and the cloven hoof that you can see under the table. <laughs> Not to mention, John Curtin's down the bottom there. <laughs> Not to mention the dripping blood. <laughs> Doesn't leave much to the imagination. On the other side, we have, let's go back for a sec. There, there's another cartoon. Hughes uh, burying his party, you can see uh, in the coffin labeled conscription. Uh, there's Hughes speaking to a recruitment rally uh, in Martin Place in Sydney in, in 1916. On the other side, by the second referendum, there are two conscription referendums, one in 16 and one in 17. The anti's creed read in part, I believe the men at the front should be sacrificed. I believe in the sanctity of my own life. I believe it was right to sink the Lusitania. I believe in the massacre of Belgian priests, who doesn't? <laughs> um, I believe that Nurse Cavell got her just desserts. I believe in handing Australia over to Germany. Well, the church should have complained about that blasphemous creed. <laughs> they didn't, apparently. The vote was no in the first referendum by a narrow margin of 72,472 and an electorate of 2.3 million. So they vote no, but not, not by an overwhelming margin. Hughes had split the Labour Party right down the middle and he and 23 other MPs left the party to eventually go into coalition with the Liberal opposition and form a new nationalist win the war party with Billy still as prime minister. I didn't leave my party, he said. They left me. It's not true. He's the one who walked out the door. A year later, the Russian Revolution precipitated the second referendum, which was defeated more convincingly, this time by 166,588 votes. This time, Hughes was hit by rotten eggs. Uh, rocks were thrown, and there was even a possible assailant with a knife at the uh, Melbourne Creek Ground. There's, the, uh, there's Simon's favourite little boy from Manly throwing a, a rotten egg at Billy. Uh, They say it's the reason he founded the Federal Police Force because the Queensland Police Force wouldn't defend him. It's not true. They're already founding the Federal Police Force. It just hurried up. Um, now, it's easy to imagine then that Australia is split down the middle uh, and that there's a line drawn and that Australia doesn't want to be involved in the war anymore uh, and they're you know, uh, seeing the light, as it were. But uh, history has a way of undercutting these things. In May 1917, in other words, in between the two conscription referenda, Hughes's nationalists won a general election on the win the war basis. 
So they win the general election in between. It's a little bit like 1975 when everybody says shame, Fraser, shame, and two weeks later then votes him into office. So there are other, other things going on under the surface here. Hughes is doing the right things, it seems, uh, for enough of the economy and doing the right things in terms of the use of the forces uh, to keep him in office. So clearly the Australian people wish to fight the war still, but to do it on their own terms. They didn't want to be conscripted. After all, what's a just war if you have to conscript? Didn't bother the Germans, didn't bother the Brits, didn't bother the Americans, didn't bother the French, but that's another story. There's a great deal of mythology surrounding the conscription referenda. Hughes blamed, indeed demonized, the Irish Catholics and the Sinn Féin Archbishop of Melbourne, Daniel Mannix. But the numbers don't add up. Only a fifth of the population were Catholic and fewer of those were Irish Catholic. A fifth of the population does not make up a majority. So most of those who voted against conscription were Protestant, Protestant working class, but Hughes couldn't finger them. So he fingers Catholics. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, farming constituencies, usually conservative, voted no, mostly in the referendum. It seems that Hughes's secretary, Percy Dean, was closer to the mark, allowing for his anti-New South Wales bias. Dean was a Victorian. Dean said, uh, after the second referendum, the awful stained clodhoppers of New South Wales, who feared for their supply of teat pullers, voted no. The unheard, unseen majority. They weren't all awful stained and they weren't all teat pullers, but they were farmers. While in London in early 1916, Hughes had met the Foreign Secretary, Sir Edward Grey, to discuss imperial spheres of influence in the Pacific. At the start of the war, Australia had seized German New Guinea and New Zealand Samoa, and New Zealand had seized Samoa, uh, thinking that the rest of the German Pacific Island colonies, the Marshalls and the Carolines that were north of the equator, would also fall to the empire. Britain, however, had promised the Northern Islands to Japan. Hughes, while protesting, told Gray that while he personally would accede to the British position, he would raise the question again in any peace settlement at war's end. In other words, he had it both ways. And there the issue remained. Uh, these are documents that, that Barb uh, discovered in his researches. Uh, Hughes, in most accounts, is seen as resisting the British position all the way through the war. He didn't changed his position and the British were pretty annoyed about it in uh, 1918. In 1918, Hughes was back in London for the Imperial War Council and Cabinet um, meeting uh, to discuss how would the United States help the Allies plan to win the war. On his way to London, he'd visited Woodrow Wilson in Washington, on the basis of whose famous 14 points the Americans had entered the war. These advocated no annexations, no indemnities, self-determination, freedom of the seas, and a new world order centered on the League of Nations. Nearly all points were anathema to the realist imperialist Hughes, who wanted to annex New Guinea, make Germany pay the bill for the war, and continue to rely on the Royal Navy, not this ethereal League of Nations for protection. Little wonder then, that when Hughes spoke to Wilson, he found the president, as he later wrote, Hughes later wrote, quote, as unresponsive as the Sphinx in the desert. And you can imagine Wilson looking out the window and not saying anything, as he disagreed totally with Hughes. Later in New York, in a speech violently attacking bloodthirsty Germany, Hughes called for an Australasian Monroe Doctrine for the South Pacific. Alarmed at the rhetoric, Wilson, President Wilson, told his Secretary of State to investigate denying Hughes a visa should he wish to return to the country. This is the Prime Minister of an ally. In other words, he didn't want Hughes running around making violent speeches and un undermining his, uh, his League of Nations. The battle lines then were being drawn for Versailles. At the peace conference, Hughes was both 
a member of the British Empire delegation and one of two representatives of Australia. The other being Sir Joseph Cook, the Navy Minister. We don't hear much about him, but he was there. In his memoirs, Hughes paints himself as the sole Australian David standing up to Wilson's American Goliath. And there's some truth in this. Wilson was certainly taller than him. But it must be remembered that Hughes was, above all, a consummate fixer. And he knew full well that his position back in Australia depended on the support of a cabinet and a parliament, the majority of whose members were strong Anglophile pro-business conservatives. So he still saw himself as a, as a loyal Labour man. Remember, his party left him, he hadn't left them. In other words, he had to watch his step. In fact, as we've found in our researches, he reported his every move at Versailles back to the cabinet in Melbourne, and he didn't uh, move without their consent. And there were several times where they overruled him. Not quite David and Goliath. There were three principal issues for Australia, annexing New Guinea and adjacent islands, protecting the white Australia immigration policy, and making Germany pay for the war. All three were interrelated. We don't have time really to talk about that now. On New Guinea, Hughes had his famous, indeed infamous, clash with Wilson. Using a specially prepared Pacific map with Australia at its centre, he made the Royal Geographical Society produce this map overnight. Poor unfortunates, but they did it. <laughs> he made his case for annexation on geostrategic grounds. New Guinea was Australia's ramparts. It's Alsace-Lorraine. It's Ireland or it's Mexico, he said. Shifting, he said, je suis ici, j'y ouest. Quoting, or well, slightly misquoting actually a French general in the Crimean War who said he wasn't gonna give up the Malakoff Heights to those ghastly Russians. I'm in New Guinea and I'm, I'm staying. Wilson wanted to internationalize the former German colonies under the new League of Nations and asked Hughes whether he was, quote, to understand that if the whole civilized world asks Australia to agree to a mandate for these islands, Australia is prepared to defy the opinion of the whole civilized world. Whereupon Hughes, after ostentatiously fiddling with the box of his large hearing aid, asked Wilson to repeat himself. <laughs> After which he said, that's about the size of it, Mr. President. And he pointed out later on that he represented 60,000 Australian war dead. Now you had to know how many Americans had died in the war to know what that meant. The American number is 57,000. In other words, more Australian blood was shed in this war than yours. Shut up, Wilson. Of course, he couldn't say that to Wilson, really, because Wilson had bankrolled the whole Allied war effort. Um, we all know that money is more important than blood. The stories, further stories about cannibals eating missionaries are apocryphal and later embellishments. We can talk about that later if you like. They're in his memoirs, but they, they're not in the official transcripts. Needless to say, Wilson was furious and privately called Hughes a pestiferous varmint. George Clemenceau, the mischievous French president, later wrote that Hughes spoke at the time symphonies of good sense. The New Guinea upshot, however, is interesting. Smuts from South Africa, aided by John Latham, a sharp lawyer from the Australian delegation, came up with a face saver in the form of the 999 year C class mandate. Uh, in Australian terms, it's a, a Clayton's colony. Well, having a colony when you're not having a colony, you can have it for 999 years and you have to report to the League of Nations about it. That got around Hughes' objections, uh, but Hughes refused to sign the original version um, and under cabinet pressure uh, was eventually told that he had to sign the final treaty which had provision for it in it. On white Australia, uh, the Japanese delegation pushed for a racial equality clause to be inserted in the League of Nations Covenant. I think that's a, 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 a no-brainer. Secretly, Wilson opposed this, aware of sensitivities in the Pacific Coast states, as did South Africa, over what was to become apartheid. 
uh, and to a lesser degree, the Canadians and New Zealanders. Hughes knew that if he agreed to this, he wouldn't survive politically in Australia. His cabinet said it was non-negotiable. Sooner, he apostrophized in the margin of one of the documents, sooner than agree to it, I would rather walk into the Seine or the Folie Bergère with my clothes off. Doesn't bear thinking about. <laughs> oh, there he is with some of his soldier mates and some more. I like the box. <laughs> Notice the Lee Vash in the background who are not interested in Billy at all. Were they horses? I know they're horses. Are they? And we all know this cartoon, I think, or many of us do. He threatened Wilson he would take the case publicly to the people of the Western United States. This is the bloke that Wilson was trying to deny a visa to. In the end, Wilson fudged the issue and swept it off the table, much to Hughes's relief and to the Japanese um, consternation at their loss of face. Wilson and Hughes, however, did support the main Japanese demand, which was to secure control of the former German concession in Shandong. Uh, and those islands north of the equator you know, that Billy had earlier been arguing about. On reparations, Hughes was one of the three British Empire representatives on the relevant commission and one of two deputy chairs. This is something people don't realize that he had another role. He argued for full compensation from Germany for Australia's 300 million pound war debt. The principle which if extended to all, would have totally crippled the German economy, destroyed the German economy, undermined the whole European economies and introduced Bolshevism into most of Europe. But Billy didn't care about that, he just wanted money. George Foster Dulles, uh, for the Americans, argued for no indemnities, but only reparations for the infrastructural war damage in Belgium and Northern France. Lloyd George put it to Hughes that for the British Empire economy to thrive, Germany's had to be rebuilt, and that heavy reparations would lead to depression uh, and Bolshevism. This liberal view prevailed. Germany was eventually asked to pay 11 billion pounds over many years, of which France would, France would receive 7 billion, and the British Empire, 2 billion. Australia was expected to receive 80 million. As it turned out, of course, by the time Germany stopped paying in 1931, Australia had received 5,571,720 pounds, and that was a got. So Australia uh, was still paying for the First World War until well after the Second. It's fair to say that at Versailles, Hughes only achieved a measure of success. Over New Guinea and white Australia, relatively successful when others in the British Empire delegation among the big four backed his demands. In other words, he wouldn't have saved, as it were, uh, white Australia if Wilson hadn't done what Wilson had done. He wouldn't have got New Guinea uh, if the French hadn't been arguing to get Alsace Lorraine back and one or two other colonies elsewhere for other people. When he was a lone voice over reparations or virtually a lone voice over, repar uh, uh, over reparations, he didn't get anywhere the outcome was much more modest. It's indisputable, however, that he had put Australia and himself on the world map as never before. To compensate for this lack of reparations, Hughes push hard, pushed hard to acquire control of the phosphate-rich former German island of Nauru. This was also coveted by Britain and New Zealand, and it was finally given to all three as a British Empire mandate on a 42-42-16 basis, New Zealand being 16. Hughes again threatened not to sign the treaty, but was undercut by his cabinet. Interestingly, however, it was estimated that over the next 50 years, Australia's share would amount to 168 million pounds worth of phosphates, phosphates uh, which of course, when put on Australian crops and on Australian pasture land would multiply uh, the outcome uh, considerably for the rural economy. So you could say, uh, they got uh, more of those reparations in a way by the back door. When Hughes presented the Treaty of Versailles for the approval of the Australian Parliament, he spoke soberly. Australia's northern approaches had been secured 
the white Australia policy was safe. But given the liberal reparations, deal, Australia would be paying off its war debt for generations. To quote him, if this peace be unjust, it is not unjust to Germany. It is very unjust to those free people who had to fight a battle of life and death for their very existence. To ask us to pay and call that justice would be an abuse of the word. Was this the hero of Versailles? He ended with a eulogy to the Australian soldier. If the fruits of victory are to be measured by national safety and liberty and the high ideals for which these boys died, the sacrifice has not been in vain. They died for the safety of Australia. Australia is safe. They died for liberty. And liberty is now assured to us and to all men. They have made themselves and their country's name and it will not die. Much has happened to Lloyd George. Hughes was deposed as prime minister, in his case in early 1923. And though he lingered in parliament another 29 years and held several more portfolios, he was never again prime minister, though he destroyed a couple of others. Hughes, the soldier's friend, had acquired the sobriquet Little Digger. And until his death in 1952, he, and afterwards his slouch hat, uh, sat on his customary chair and presided over the Sydney Anzac Day March. The hat still does. A coda. Hughes had been in the New South Wales and in the federal parliament for over half a century, as I've said. He was still in harness at his death. By then, he'd been in five different parties and the leader of four of them. When he was in his 80s, Hughes was asked by Arthur Fadden, the leader of the country party, the one party which Hughes had never been a member, which Hughes had never been a member, why he hadn't joined it. Billy replied, quick as a flash, I had to draw the line somewhere. <laughs> Thank you. Where's Billy? Where's Billy? Now, where is he? That, no, that, no, that's the Hall of Mirrors. That's the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. Billy's in the picture. Where is he? Oh, no. If you're not demented, fight, look upon the rice. No. On the right? They all look the same, don't they? Second. Yeah. Not a very good. He said, he said to William Orpen when he's painting this, he said, be, he said, don't be just, be merciful. Did you write the Did you write the Australian Prime Minister? Prime Minister? No. <laughs> um, um, he's one of them. Uh, but he, he, I mean, you can't have somebody who splits his party down the middle and causes such angst um, and, uh, you know, continues to do so. Uh, as uh, you know, as, as, as a great prime minister, um, no, Curtin and Curtin and Menzies are above him, I think, uh, and then you can argue for some of the others. Um, but uh, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put him there. He's certainly the Australian prime minister who's made the biggest splash on the international stage. I think that's true. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My name's David, and thank you for a fascinating lecture about an extraordinary character. Uh, the last few weeks, I've been occasionally musing on who might have been better to take this country through the recent crises of uh, Brexit and, uh, <laughs> and COVID. And, um, you know, names like Blair, even Thatcher have been suggested by various friends, and I think, you know, there's something in that. 
people who are efficient at doing things, was Billy Hughes the best prime minister for Australia to have during the war? I suspect your answer is going to be no, but I'd like to hear a brief. Uh, uh, it's hard to know. I mean, we've only really got um, uh, Fisher to compare him to, who actually was prime minister before him during the war. Uh, and Fisher uh, was burnt out by it, really, um, whereas Hughes relished the whole business. He's a bit like Churchill in that. Um, and you could say that he delivered the goods for the war and for the economy, and in doing so, he, he split the nation. Um, and that's a, that's a mixed... Now, somebody else might have kept the nation together and not done the deals that Billy did. We don't know. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a hypothetical. Um, who, who in those ranks around him might have been? There was Joseph Cook, who was Prime Minister before him. Uh, I don't think Cook uh, carried the guns. Um, uh, there were one or two among the state premiers who were pretty good, Holman in New South Wales, um, uh, Ryan in Queensland, who might have made the transition, but making the transition to federal politics has been much more difficult uh, since 1901. I mean, when Billy did it, everyone did it in 1901, because we're all the ones in federal parliament. Um, it's hard to know how to think of who would have been, unless you, you know, unless you cast around and say, oh, okay, let's let let let's do a bit of time travel and put, put John Curtin in as prime minister. And, and but John Curtin, uh, the anti-conscription leader in uh, in 1916, who spent a couple of days in jail, might not have uh, <laughs> might not have uh, seen what he saw later on had really not been there before him. That's an interesting interesting conjecture. I, no, I ducked that one. I'm sorry, Dan. <laughs> Oh, okay, I guess I um, so my question is kind of a two-parter, hope you don't mind. The first one is you mentioned how he had he was he was a part of five political parties, being the leader of four of them. So besides the labor, labor and the liberal government, they eventually joined during the war. Or were the other three um, parties they eventually found a home in? The second question is, given his long career, 50 plus years in Parliament, Parliament one, one in Parliament and also New South Wales legislature, how do you explain his longevity in those in that political scene? Yeah, um, interesting. Uh, the parties were uh, first party is the Labour Party, then he's in the uh, National Labour Party, which is the rump of the Labour Party. Uh, then he joins uh, the National Party. Uh, eventually, the National Party then becomes the United Australia Party, uh, and he's in it. Uh, and then the United Australia Party becomes the Liberal Party, the new Liberal Party, Menzies Liberal Party, and he's briefly in it until Menzies kicked him out because he wouldn't take the whip properly. Surprise, surprise. Uh, so that's the answer to your first question. Um, the second question was again, is that me? Why, oh, why is longevity? Uh, he was good at, um, at electorate hopping. So when it got too hot for him uh, uh, in, originally in Sydney and he's in a Western Labour seat, he went to Bendigo in Victoria, which was a, a conservative seat. Um, when that got dangerous for him, he went back to North Sydney, which again was a safe seat. Um, so he, uh, you know, he played his cards well. People liked having him as their MP. He, he turned up, he was energetic. He did things for people. He was, he was a good constituency MP. And he was in the news all the time. And um, that's good fun. Um, Bradfield, became Bradfield in the end, North Sydney, then Bradfield. Carl, I'm gonna steal some time and take the chair's prerogative. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, uh, or, or you, in dealing with Hugh, Billy Hughes, you must come across the sort of contradictions of the man and his ideas. You could you possibly tell us a little bit more about them and how you make sense of someone who was pro labor and for the underdog, but at the same time supported conscription and opposed racial equality mm -hmm. uh, moves? How do you make sense of that? How do you make sense of his? ideas you mentioned realism as something as, as sort of a driving force is that what he was or do you see something else underneath yeah no i think they well it's his his labor tradition is a labor tradition that that goes back to um uh the labor movement in britain uh, uh which is about protecting the workers rights of the people who are in the unions uh and that's where the racial thing comes in in part uh, not to excuse it, but that's where it was. 
interesting, he said in Parliament, I mean, he used to say different things to different people as they do, a bit like Bob Hawker's accent used to change depending on the audience he was talking to, or even Tony Blair did the same thing. Um, you know, good politics. Uh, he, he used to change. So in Parliament, he said, we, we, I don't trust the Japanese because they're too good. He said, they're more efficient than we are and they do, they do a great job. I don't want them here because they're going to outside and it's all racial vilification. And when he's talking to the Japanese, it's, um, you know, you don't quite know where, where he is. Uh, he uh, once said, I mean, this is where the realism thing comes in, and one of his secretaries, he had 100, 130 secretaries, he used to sack secretaries like nobody's business. Uh, he, um, one of his secretaries said, oh, uh, all he's interested in is power. And there's a sense in which that's true. I mean, he's a politician who will jump around depending on, on the circumstances. Um, but if he had, he would say he was always for the underdog, um, for the underdog in the union movement, and then broad, more broadly speaking for Australia, and then more broadly, in a sense, again, talking about making the economy work, which was good for everybody. So there was that sort of logic there. Uh, but yes, they were full of contradictions. Um, but, uh, who was it who, who said that only the mediocre are consistent? Somebody did. <laughs> Finished? No. Uh, two questions from the, the deep, one light-hearted one from me and one from your rugby playing grandson, which is a little bit more on topic. Uh, thanks for the lecture today, really stimulating, fun as always, and I'll, I'll always be grateful as a POM for you introducing me to the Menzies lecture. Uh, today was no uh, difference and uh, always great nuggets coming out. Uh, given that this is something of a valedictory lecture and you are a published writer, in that critting Bible wisdom, I hope the audience don't mind me <laughs> pivoting from the Great War to the Battle of uh, Leather on Willem. Um, we've seen this week extraordinary prowess from the English cricket team. Sunny New Zealand. English cricket team. <laughs> I know they're number one. Listen, listen. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I'm going to be back. I hope you've got so a question. Highly I hope you've got a question. Let me get the question out. So we've seen, we've seen the brilliance of the English cricket team this week. And no doubt you've noticed. Some this. people have seen it. Yeah, oh, well, along with your along with your trans Tasman rivals. Uh, so, with a beleaguered Australian team coming to England next year, uh, how do you hold their hopes? I don't know. We'll see how they go in Sri Lanka, which is where they hope the moment. Which is probably a tougher gig. But anyway, uh, we don't know. Who knows? Who knows? If you keep bringing out those as reprobate old fast bowlers who will be bowling underarm by then, you know who knows. <clears throat> We do all that. Indeed. Now, now uh, yeah, what's, Ed, what's Edward's question? It's much more serious. What does his story tell us about rugby and politics? Rugby? So, Billy, <laughs> Billy Hughes, uh, you went to the first part. Billy. Um, Billy Hughes played a big role in setting up rugby league in Australia. That's true. He did. He did play a role in setting up rugby league. Yes, that's true. That's so what true. What are the transferable skills from Billy Hughes' story between rugby and football? Getting your workers paid. That's that's what it was about. Just wage. Uh, you didn't get it if you played rugby union, but you did if you played rugby league. That's uh, what it was about. Otherwise known as shamatism. Anyway. <laughs> Um, that was really fascinating, Carl, and you probably saw me taking loads of notes because um, a lot of that resonated with me and I really wish my grandparents were still here and I could ask them about this. So um, thank you for such a wonderful lecture. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, and actually it was the question about New Zealand that prompted me to think about um, vote, women voting, sorry, mm -hmm. <laughs> Ta tangential, but this... Um, this was the period when um, women were voting in Australia. Yes. So what, what, would, would you be able to say a little bit about the Hughes yeah, yeah. and that? Yeah, that, no, would no. Be, I, that would be really interesting. I'm not trying to wrong foot you or anything. No, no, no. Sort of uh, that, well, um, it's interesting that, that uh, well, two yeah. things, uh, I suppose. Uh, one, one that um, Labor policies um, 
uh, the baby bonus, other things uh, were, you know, appealed to the women's electorate and his was behind that um, and continued to be, uh, you know, through his career in the health in the 30s and you know, interested in those sorts of things. Um, also a natural communicator who would all, always talk to his whole audience, a bit like Menzies, you know, pick up who was out there. Um, so he's, he's comfortable, uh, brought up by his, by his uh, by, by in, in a women's family. His father was, was in London. Uh, and he's brought up by his aunt. Um, so very comfortable doing those things. Um, most women in Australia voted for conscription. Mm. <laughs> we don't really know why, but there's a, there's a tendency uh, to vote for well, conscription. Maybe it comes back to why they want votes so much. Well, yeah. So, so what I'm saying is that the, the, that proportion of the electorate that, that, that he's applying, he's appealing to, uh, the women went along with, it, or enough of them did, but not enough to introduce conscription. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, not that I know are involved in politics, but he does have, have descendants, uh, quite a few descendants. Um, but I don't know. I don't know enough about their, their careers. I know whether they've ever been involved in politics. They're not like uh, Miss Spender and one or two others who've come out of the woodwork lately as as teals. But, uh, yeah, no, I don't know. I don't think so. I think we know if that were the case. Professor, sorry to ask another question, but it seemed to be about it's what intrigues me about this man is it's very hard to discern kind of guiding philosophy. And that kind of reminds me of another politician who seemed to turn to do anything that put him in power. Mm -hmm. Is that is that the idea? Is that was that your sort of thing? Well, a political historian some years ago once described politics as a broken-backed activity, a broken-backed activity, by which he meant uh, that staying in power and you know catching a wave of this and, uh, and appealing to that is what politicians do. And that if we're looking for consistency there, uh, we'll probably find it on the backbenches among the redwoods of this world who write books and don't do the stuff. Uh, that's, that's the short answer. Um, now you get, you get you get exceptions to that. I think I mean Thatcher is a bit more of an exception. I mean she was pretty consistent in the sorts of things uh, she was doing. But most politicians aren't. Most political leaders aren't. Churchill certainly wasn't. Um, Blair wasn't. Uh, you know, there, there are lots of. It doesn't mean they're bad politicians. I think it's just the nature of politics. Uh, thank you. Uh, we are led to believe that the whole purpose of studying history any part, any time, is to learn lessons from the past so that we apply it and don't make the same mistakes at present and in future. Bearing in mind, the, and I don't want to insult your intelligence under the peasants, at the time that Britain was the big, ruled the waves and was the biggest power uh, and put, arguably, in the whole history of the world. And Australia was just an extension of, the, of Britain and the British power abroad. So what's the lesson and how do you compare and compare in comparison with the present situation of overall British policy internationally towards Ukraine, towards asylum seekers, towards uh, United Nations, to international law. How do you assess that? And what is the lesson? Uh, thank you. Your guess is as good as mine. Uh, uh, but uh, the, uh, I suppose, uh, thinking about it a little bit, the, the, uh, the uh, those of us who study history are more inclined, I think, many of us to the Mark Twain view, which is that history uh, doesn't repeat itself, but it might rhyme. In other words, there are certain lessons in the past about how not to do things and ways of doing things, uh, but things don't occur in exactly the same way again. 
there'll always be the differences. Uh, so uh, what you want is people who are uh, skilled, uh, who can, can manage those, uh, those things and can see further than the next election, uh, but also win the next election. Uh, and that's what politicians are all trying to do. You could say there's a quite a shortage in the world at the moment of people who look beyond the next election. Is Mr. Macron, Monsieur Macron, looking past next Saturday? <laughs> well, he is and he isn't. <laughs> Short answer. How far ahead is Boris Johnson really looking? For his next book deal, I suspect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. How far is she looking? How far is she looking? <laughs> You probably see me somewhere about in the distance. 